So welcome, welcome everyone. Um, it is our pleasure to welcome everybody. Bienvenue à tous. Uh, je vous ai mis sur cette uh, petite présentation, Happy Earth Day. So today is Earth Day. And uh, we think that it's a, a good day to celebrate the Earth um, by reflecting on our daily actions to protect it. Uh, what do we do every day you know, to reduce our waste, uh, to reduce our water usage, maybe to reduce also uh, you know, how, we, how we move, how we go from one place to another. Um, it's very important to, um, to protect the Earth. We have only one. Um, but it's, it's also important not uh, to think about daily actions and not just to limit uh, Earth Day or protecting the Earth uh, to sustainability, but uh, we think that it's also important to think about wildlife and endangered species. And um, today uh, I am pleased to welcome uh, Jean-Gaël Collomb, who is um, Luca and Chloe's dad. So welcome Jean-Gaël. And uh, we'll, you'll meet later Robin Appleton, uh, who is a conversationist, and she will explain our project um, about uh, an endangered uh, species uh, in Peru called uh, the spectacled bear, les lours à lunettes. Um, so um, here, how we are going to, to, to see. So we will see a video of about 20 minutes from uh, Robin. Um, so she will be talking about uh, the video and uh, the spectacle bear conservation. Before that, Jean-Gaël will, uh, will share also a, a short video about an upcoming event that you are all welcome to attend this weekend. And uh, at the, after the, the video, there will be a discussion between Jean-Gaël and Robin. So you know, just an interview style, Jean-Guerre and I will discuss about the project. And at the end, uh, you will be able to use the chat box um, to ask your question or raise your hand. And if you want to ask a question to Jean-Guerre and Robin, you are uh, welcome to, to do so. So uh, once again, uh, welcome everybody. Um, so for the kids, especially the kids, please be present um do do not do something else right and uh, and then we can uh, really have a good conversation about uh, wildlife conversation conservation sorry so i'm gonna stop sharing and i'm gonna uh hand over to jean gaël who will uh share with us um a video before we start Great. Well, thank you very much, Sebastian. And I want to say a, a big warm hello, happy Earth Day to all the EB students, the EB parents, the EB faculty. As an EB parent myself, I want to also say a huge thank you to all the EB faculty and students for bearing through an incredible year. Uh, I think this year is really important to celebrate Earth Day. I think we've all come to realize uh, how fragile our relationship with nature is. Um, without getting too scientific. I think part of the reasons why we're dealing with, uh, with something like COVID has to do with how we interact with nature. And it's just really important to keep in mind uh, all of those connections as we try to take care of our planet and also of each other. A lot of, uh, of wildlife conservation really comes down to uh, understanding the need that people have, uh, people all over the world have. And uh, all of you have a role to play in wildlife conservation. I know that some of you have organized um, cleanups of local parks, and uh, that's a great way to get engaged. Uh, so if the work doesn't have to be um, far and distant and go into to faraway places, uh, but it can certainly go there. I've been fortunate enough uh, in my career to start uh, working in Central Africa, studying chimpanzees and gorillas. That's where my initial passion was. Uh, so I studied the conservation biology, and now I run an international wildlife conservation organization that protects uh, species all over the globe. I'm going to share my screen for a second and, and show you a quick video that gives an overview of the kind of work that we do. And uh, then we will launch into the presentation by Robin that specifically looks at how to protect the only bear species in South America, the spectacle bears. That video is going to be about 20 minutes and then we'll have a conversation with, with um, Robin and myself and, uh, and then open it up for questions. So let me 
Let me share my screen. It's going to take a few minutes as we do that. And then we'll do the video and then turn it over to Robin. Uh, Sebastian also mentioned that we have an event coming up this, uh, this Saturday. It's called the Wildlife Conservation Expo. I could put a, a link to it in the chat. And we could also send it to, to the school. There is a free sign up. Um, and so anybody who's got a couple of hours to spare this Saturday can come and listen to more presentations like the one that you'll see from Robin. I'm gonna play the video now and then we'll see you in about, uh, in about four minutes. We share our planet with the most extraordinary wildlife. These animals are a source of beauty, excitement, and laughter. <laughs> they fascinate and inspire, shape our cultures, and keep our planet healthy. And while many species are being pushed to the brink, <laughs> we know they are essential and irreplaceable. Um, At Wildlife Conservation uh, Network, we find conservationists with bold, effective solutions and support them combating threats like poaching, illegal wildlife trade, habitat loss, and climate change. Our conservation heroes are saving wildlife on every continent on Earth. We envision a world where people and wildlife can coexist and thrive. We provide ongoing, in-depth support to a network of partners conducting long-term, on-the-ground conservation work in specific places. While our wildlife funds protect threatened wildlife across a larger landscape, investing in projects from institutions big and small to save a species throughout its entire habitat. And with an eye towards the future, we provide scholarships and grants to empower the next generation of conservationists, building local leadership and conservation around the world. We support conservationists who work within communities to understand the needs of local people and jointly develop solutions. Because protecting wildlife doesn't just help animals, it improves the lives of people and it's people who are at the heart of conservation solutions. Those living alongside wildlife and the conservationists and supporters who invest in the work. Through transparency and efficiency, 100% of our donors' money goes to the work they care about and they know the impact of their investment. The Wildlife Conservation Network is a bridge between donors and the work in the field. Through opportunities like our Wildlife Conservation Expo, we connect conservationists and supporters, individuals and institutions, creating community working together for wildlife. We believe there is hope for even the most threatened species, and we all have a role to play to make that hope a reality. No one organization or one person can save wildlife. It takes collaboration. That's why we've supported hundreds of organizations and always keep an open mind for new ideas and new partnerships. Together, we are creating a future for wildlife. Great, thank you very much. That was long. Okay, so I'm gonna go over to it was am I back really on, Sebastian? Nice. Yes. All right. So All right. okay. Um, so thank you very now much. It's be, yeah, go go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, now it's gonna be my, my pleasure to uh, to introduce um, a dear friend and colleague, Robin Appleton. Robin um, has been working to protect spectacle bears or Indian bears for several decades. Um, so you'll hear about her story and her work. Um, and then we'll have a chance to, to talk with Robin and ask her questions. Um, her work takes place in a, in a country in South America called Peru. Um, 
uh, these are the only bears found throughout South America, and you'll, you'll find out all about them. For those of you who might be wondering if you've seen those bears before, if you've ever read a Paddington the Bear book, that's the bear that it was inspired from. So without further ado, let's turn it over to Robin, who is an incredible conservationist, human being, and a dear friend. And I'm really thankful that you could join us and share this with us. So Sebastian, up to you. Okay, thank you very much. Here we are. Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining me today and I really wish it was in person but I'm still really happy to be here to talk about bears. There are eight species of bears found from the Arctic to Peru to Borneo and Europe and they need a variety of habitats to survive. Protecting habitats for bears benefits thousands of other species including ourselves. If the land is healthy enough to support a fit bear population then it is also healthy enough to support humans. Because bears are found in so many different places, by protecting bears in their habitat, we're indirectly protecting other wildlife and entire ecosystems. In fact, if we can protect all of the eight bear species, we would actually protect one third of our planet covering four continents, as you can see here in the map. One of the most elusive and poorly known bears in the world lives in South America. Can you guess what that is? The spectacle bear. Almost nothing is known about their ecology, and they exist in small, scattered populations from Venezuela to Bolivia. Unfortunately, their populations are declining rapidly. We suspect there may be as little as 5,000 left in, in the wild, scattered throughout small islands of habitat in South America. While spectacle bears are known to be adaptable and occupy a variety of habitats and altitudes throughout their range, the historic range for spectacle bears has declined dramatically in recent years due to the accelerated pace of expansion of human-dominated landscapes from commercial and subsistence agriculture, such as this seen in the photo. You can see hills and hills of, of agriculture. And due to extreme human pressure, such as the community expansion which brings new roads, large swaths of forests are removed or burned for agriculture, such as this rice plantation in an area that would have been such great summer habitat for bears. And not to mention COVID. What has that done to this bear population? Well, bear bile is a substance secreted by the liver and stored in a bear's gallbladder. And this has particularly become a concern for us because the Chinese government has been promoting the use of bear bile as a cure to COVID. Traditional medicine in Peru is still used by people from rural areas and given the widespread impact of coronavirus in Peru and the recommendations by the Chinese government to use bear bile, we fear this may trigger an increase in poaching of an already vulnerable population. And we are currently seeing this as you can see in the photo. Rapid habitat loss and out of control wildfires now threaten spectacle bear habitat, leaving many bear populations with very limited food such as this plant called sapote, which is a critical bear food. It is not only removed for agriculture, but it is burned by out of control wildfires started to clear the land for agriculture purposes. Only last year we witnessed thousands of acres of prime bear habitat burned to the ground. And bears like this mom and two month old cub cannot survive and die due to starvation as females are no longer able to lactate. Hey, Sophia, they don't survive. <laughs> the spectacle bear occupies a range that covers only 3% of the area of South America. However, it does coincide with the habitat of at least 76% of all South American species. So it is vitally important for the planet to ensure this bear species thrives in the wild. In 2006, we discovered a small and unique bear population in the equatorial dry forest of northern Peru. The first bear we saw in this arid ecosystem we named Laura. She was a really special bear. And in 2019, we created our new logo in her memory, which is inspired by the strong connection between mother and cub and represents resilience, hope, and continuity of the spectacle bear. We work in a watershed in northern Peru that encompasses three distinct ecosystems with a large elevation gradient between 800 and 12,000 feet. However, for the next few years, we are focusing our conservation program in the equatorial dry forest 
due to the speed at which this ecosystem is being destroyed. It's a lots of cactus and spiny rock faced cliffs. It is very arid and it is relatively open, making it so much easier to spot bears in this ecosystem, which has allowed us to monitor them, observe them, and learn so much about them in the wild. Precipitation, however, is low, and years can go by with very little rain, if any, making this challenging for both people and wildlife, not to mention our field teams, as we have to carry water wherever we go. Laura, the first bear we met here, was an unusual and curious bear. She opened her world to us and showed us how bears in this harsh environment survive. In later years, she also introduced us to her male companions, who taught us so much about spectacle bears in general. Like this male, Chris, who makes a shrilling noise to let you know this is breeding season, and that he is ready to stand his ground and protect his territory. He also showed us that this was a territory that our field teams would not easily navigate. We had to place ropes all around the area and the rock faces to try to keep up with the bears and to continue our observation study. This young bear is climbing down to try to reach some of the snails that you can see tucked underneath a little ledge there. I'm at the zoo right now. Wow. But sometimes these bears just go places that we really don't want to go. They use the cliffs to reach honey and the snails and other things hanging over these cliffs. And then there was her other male bear companion, Marco, the very chilled out bear that continues to cause us trouble by ripping down our cameras all the time. He taught us how important the small spring fed water holes were for bears, particularly male bears that use these water holes to leave their scent so that female bears knew that they had arrived. These water holes are a small oasis in such an arid ecosystem. And you can see that little tiny green dot in the background. There's only a few fig trees that protect the little tiny water hole. Water, but it's what keeps the wildlife alive in this ecosystem. And then bears like this, Marco, spend a lot more time than the average bear, just chilling out, cooling himself down, playing with the leaves. <laughs> this was Marco earlier in the year. January can be some of the hottest, well, one of the hottest times of the year. He definitely looks like he owns the place. But the water is limited and often dries out in the very dry winter months when the temperatures continue to be high. So that's usually June or July or August and it's still pretty hot but there can be next to no water left. You can see this bear here trying to sit in this little tiny water hole but there's not much water there and you can hear the deep breathing trying to cool himself down. water trickles down too and it creates kind of a mud so this is a way that they can try to cool themselves down you can see this bear trying to put his entire body all over the mud
then there's this bear Jorge. Earlier this year, he confirmed that the dry forest bear populations, but bear population do in fact eat meat. This is a recent video from a few months ago taken on one of our camera traps. However, they do spend most of their time feeding on fruits and trees, actually. But this bear was pretty lucky. It was most likely killed by a cougar, puma. And I did say trees, actually. They eat trees like a beaver would eat a tree. This is one of the few foods they have during the winter months, and it can take them up to two weeks to eat the entire tree. This is a young pup just feeding on the pasayo tree. The mum has to come and break it open because they're so hard, and then the cub just pulls little bits and pieces out. Kind of wonder how they get much nutrients from that, but they can spend up to six months feeding on just that. So like this is an example of the tree. It provided uh, food for over 10 days for a mother and cub. And the great news is the trees are not destroyed and they continue to grow again. Like you can see this pasayo tree with a little tiny tree coming out of the broken trunk. But foods like this overo fruit, which is available in small patches around the dry forest throughout the year, provide the needed calories for these bears as well. And when the bears have finished eating, they pass the seeds through their scats and they help the dry forest to continue to regenerate. So this is really important for this type of ecosystem. However, due to extreme human pressure, such as community expansion, which brings new roads, large swaths of forest are removed or burned, and critical food sources such as the sapote tree are destroyed for agriculture and burned in out of control wildfires. Last year, thousands of acres of key sapote and overo habitat were destroyed and so little remained for bears. And bears, particularly females with cubs, are starving from limited access to key food resources. In fact, the cub survival rate in this area is as low as 20%, so they have very little chance at life. And this is a video of a small bear that had recently left a cub, most likely because she had stopped lactating. Female bears in this condition just cannot produce milk. You can see how skinny she is. The back end is, should be nice and round and it kind of slants down and her bones and her ribs are all showing. However, as seen in these photos, that same skinny bear was able to access the potain overo fruit, and within four months, she had double in size. It's not just about protecting the habitat. Human disturbances from nearby villages also play a negative role in preventing bears from accessing the food they need in the low elevation habitat where free ranging cattle ranching is a common practice. But this occurs across all the watershed from 800 feet all the way up to 12,000 feet. With people and cattle often come dogs, which change, which, which chase and frighten bears away. So what is the solution? Our strategy is a combination of community empowerment, habitat protection, and research. Much of the land is owned by local indigenous communities, and we need to work closely with them to help conserve it. Environmental education plays a key role in conservation because if they grow up to love and appreciate the bears, then they will want to protect them. In the last year, we have recently, in the last year, we have reached thousands Pica -pico. of school children in the Leche watershed in more than 10,000, 10 villages that live adjacent to prime bear wow. habitat. We also use our rescued animals to teach children to Beautiful, Dorothy. I'm going to stop here. Just uh, can you please mute yourself? Thank you very much. And we go over the, the video and then we can discuss. Thank you. Dick pets, which helps foster empathy and respect for all animals and depends and deepens their connection to bears. However, working with the local villages, as well as providing an alternative lively, livelihood is also very important for the protection of bear habitat. Our most important alternative livelihood program is our felty program, which involves the production of small handcrafted woolen animals using a method called dry needle felting. So it's basically a needle and some wool and some wool. Many participants are earning an income for the first time in their lives. And since beginning this program in 2009, our felty team has grown substantially. And each year we train new women from key villages surrounding prime bear habitat to become part of this program. 
In 2019, we made over 12,000 felted animals that were sold across North America. Felty also provides a direct economic benefit. Our felty artisans are from rural and indigenous communities. They become empowered to earn a fair wage. We sell these products in retail stores throughout Canada and the US and Christmas markets. Unfortunately, this year, most of the Christmas markets are not running due to COVID and this is a time with the, with the help of so many uh, volunteers that we sell over 75% of our products. So please consider purchasing our products online or contacting us if you know of any stores that may be interested in carrying our felted ornaments. We need to keep these women working. If we can increase the number of products sold each year, we can get more and more communities involved and scale up the program and direct, directly protect more bear habitat. More felties mean more bears protected. And while the women are on hold due to COVID-19, we continue to provide them with a salary as we are very concerned for the women and their negative effects this pandemic will have on them and their families. So please consider supporting this and other programs at SBC. We are also focusing our efforts on locating and protecting bears in their 250,000 acres area. You can see that here in the blue. We suspect that this is the last remaining dry forest bear population that survives today. Our immediate goal is to locate all low elevation dry forest habitat used by, by bears and protect it as quickly as possible through land purchase and restoration. Purchasing key parcels of privately owned land critical for bear survival would, will rapidly protect this habitat. Strategic land purchase has the potential to protect the entire dry forest bear population. The habitat seen here in the dotted yellow line is all privately owned intact forest where we have found bears and after 14 years of field work and monitoring these bears we recently had one of the greatest surprises of our life. <laughs> While we were all under quarantine during this intense COVID period our camera traps continued to run and photograph a number of bears where you can see the red dot here on this map. It's an area that we had never imagined could be inhabited by bears. In fact it is so arid that cattle rarely venture there and it is surrounded by agriculture landscape so we never in our wildest dreams thought we would find bears here. And this is the first uh, photograph we have from this bear in the area. And it appears that the bears came to this area to feed on, on overo fruit as seen here in the scat. This new area has one of the highest concentrations of overo fruit in the region. One of the most promising things about this discovery is that it is habitat is located between two national parks and the parks you can see on the left of this map has been completely cut off from any forested landscape. By working with the government and private landowners, we can create one contiguous protected habitat for bears. And our short-term vision can be seen here on the map in green. One huge area for bears that they can move freely through without being impacted by roads, agriculture, and humans. Our team in the past month have already been exploring this area now and leaving camera traps in as many places as possible. And to our surprise, once again, it's not just the bears that like this area. Numerous other species have now been documented to use this area. And like the bears in our other study, they love to move the cameras, lick the camera, slobber on the cameras and make them really blurry. So. This camera trap is in fact in focus, but it's covered in slobber. This is an ocelot cat and we have very, very uh, few videos and photographs on our camera traps of this over the last 14 years. So it's really exciting to see. Thanks to the support of many caring Very people, tough. we have begun the process of pur purchasing parcels of key sapote habitat lo located adjacent to this newly discovered bear population. Our short-term goal now is to link the three protected areas through land purchase and restoration. Just imagine how amazing this would be to see a series of protected areas created to allow bears to move freely and to have enough food to keep both themselves and their cubs alive.
This will ensure that female bears like this can become fat enough to reproduce and successfully add new bears into this bear population. That's a female there in one of her dens. And cubs like this can have the opportunity to live in the wild. With your support, we can stop bear starvation. You can have a direct impact by preventing the only bear in South America from going extinct in the wild. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you. Interview or ask a question to uh, Robin, who should be in the call. Uh, uh, I, I'll let Sebastian no. let you handle the, the noise. Yeah. I'm gonna get um, Robin hopefully on screen with me. But I love the enthusiasm from everybody. It's awesome to see. Keep keep it up. That's the biggest thing you can do to make sure the planet is healthy for people and for its wildlife. Uh, being, a, being a conservationist doesn't have to be a wildlife biologist. There are plenty of things that one can do. And we're gonna talk a little bit about this with, uh, with Robin. But, uh, but you see the, the diversity of, uh, of animals that one can see in some of these places and the diversity of work that it, that it takes to really make sure we can protect them. And um, a lot of the work uh, certainly does involve knowing your biology and understanding an animal's movement and determining what, uh, what they use in the habitat. You might have heard the term scat often. Uh, now that everybody's muted, I can, I can say scat is poop. So whenever animals eat something, then they poop it out and that really contributes to regenerating uh, the ecosystem. But now it is, I see Robin's joined me on the screen. It's awesome. Yeah. Robin, thank you so much for, for coming and, and joining us. Robin is also a parent, so she knows all about excited children. And um, I'd love to maybe hear, Robin, um, what, um, what got you started in this? What were you like when you were, you know, in the fourth grade, fifth grade? What were you like as a, as a child related to animals? I'm sure you've got tons of fun stories. <laughs> Thanks, JJ. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me here today. It's really exciting, of course, always to talk about bears. Um, but yeah. Um, I started a long, long time ago with bears. So obviously bears are my favorite animal, but I also love worms and scorpions and everything basically that moves on this planet. But um, I used to do a lot of camping in, um, I live in Canada. And so I used to do a lot of camping with my parents and my dad used to always tell us stories, not ghost stories, but stories about bears. And so we used to lie there in the tents and we would hear the rustling of the bushes. And my dad was telling me, about the bears and how the bears are out there looking for as much food as they can because they have to go to sleep. So unlike you and I, we go to sleep at night. These birds go to sleep for half the year. Can you imagine going into your bedroom and having to sleep for six months? I wish. You're starving. Yeah, well, you've got to get enough food, don't you? So that's what the bears do. They eat, 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 eat all day. This is black bears and grizzly bears. And then they go to sleep. And so that always fascinated me, thinking about this big, huge black bear walking around needing to eat so much. That's kind of how... I think things started when I was probably about all of your ages. <laughs> Great. So I know you, I, I do want to keep asking you a question, but I also see, and I don't know if I see others, but I see Anais has her hand raised. And I saw Anais raising her hand actually during the presentation too. So I was feeling that you have a burning question. So go ahead. We'll have you ask it. Well, I'm asking about how can I join you with, and also I really liked when, you said that there was this camera that kept on getting slobber that was pretty cute. <laughs> yeah, the, the cameras are pretty funny, actually. I don't know. I have a, actually a couple of friends up in Canada as well that um, have purchased camera traps and they put them in their backyards and they can see what kind of wildlife are walking around at nighttime. So depending where you all live, it, it's actually quite interesting. I mean, sometimes you have foxes or coyotes or here we have lots of bears and cougars walking by. So that's even interesting. There's so much going on outside of your house that you might not even notice. A lot of wildlife and a lot of domestic animals as well. So that's something interesting you can do. But you can also get some of those books that have the tracks and learn what animals are around your area. I'm sure you've got some 
some parks, wilderness area, and you can go out looking for, for wildlife. And there's so much that that can tell you, not just looking at the scat, right, or the poop. <laughs> it's seeing, seeing the footprints and then following them. And you might actually spot them sometime looking for a deer or not sure what exactly you have in your area, but sure TJ knows. Yeah, well, there are tons of things you can do to to join, quote unquote. I mean, you can spread the word, tell people about um, these rare spectacle bears in South America. Um, there are things to do locally. There are wildlife clubs locally. If there isn't, you could always start one. Uh, the Jane Goodall Institute has a great program called Roots and Shoots, and um, you could always see if they have something active nearby. You could start something at, at EB. I know there are several of you at EB already who love wildlife. Um, and, uh, and keep on getting educated about it. I see tons of hands up, this is awesome. So I'm gonna call on, on Lulu next um, and then we'll, uh, we'll try to work it down the line. And I may never have to ask my own questions to Robin, this is great. <laughs> so I think it's uh, Louise, uh, Sebastian. I don't know if they can unmute themselves or if you control yes. that. Yes, Louise, you can unmute yourself. Um, uh, I was gonna ask, um, have you ever seen like a very rare animal in one of the camera traps? Have you ever seen a rare animal? Um, yeah, yeah. Well, outside of the bear, I mean, the bear was the, the rarest that we actually found at the beginning, but we, um, we actually found a new cat species for that area called a jaguarundi. So it's a, it looks like a cross between a cougar and something else. I'm not exactly sure, but it was really different. And at the time, I didn't know what it was. And I saw the camera trip and I said, oh no, there's this funny looking cat. What is this? And as it turns out, we found this new species for the area and it had never crossed over the Andes mountains down onto the coast. So that was really exciting for us, but I felt pretty silly that I didn't know what it was. But of course I didn't know what it was. It was new. So I had never seen one before. So cool. Yeah. So I don't know who that is next. Um, you were drinking something a second ago. I see your name is three. Yeah, I see you smiling now. So go ahead. You're gonna have to unmute yourself. Tom, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, I'm gonna. Busy. Oh, finally. Um, I have a forest behind behind my behind my neighborhood. And once I saw a deer. You saw a deer behind your house? Uh, no, no. I said I have a, like a forest behind my house, and once I saw a deer. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, there, there are tons of. I mean, Robin living in Canada. We actually have a fair amount of wildlife uh, here in in Berkeley. Um, we've got deer coming through for. Several one of us sometimes see um, wild turkeys walking around. We've been uh, surprised by raccoons. So it's surprising and amazing the amount of wildlife you can find in your own backyard. And that's often where, where it all starts. So next, I'm going to go to Sofia Fanucci. Uh, Sofia, you can unmute yourself. Um, I, have, uh, I have roses and uh, a, a fig tree in my backyard and um, uh, recently my fig tree grew figs and oh, we just we lost the yeah. connection I feel I don't know where Sophia was going with that but yeah there's 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 wilderness, nature all around us. And, and I think many of us can, can learn from that. But do you wanna know something really funny about thinking about fig trees? Do you know what the bear's most favorite, favorite food is? Does anyone take a guess? It's a fig. <laughs> so it's a family of the fig tree called ficus. That's the, the Latin name, the scientific name for the tree. And in our area that we study these bears, there's five fig trees, that's it. And they have thousands and thousands of figs, and that's what the bears look for if they can. So, if there were spectacle bears living in San Francisco, I bet they would go to your backyard and feed on those <laughs> fig trees. That would be pretty cool. Um, next, I see I'm going to skip over people who've already asked a question. Um, Alina? If you unmute yourself, go. Um, 
I, um, my mom and my dog were going on a walk once and they got chased by a deer. Oh dear. Lots you know of what? I, 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 I bet that that deer was probably just really, really frightened because deer are so scared of people and dogs. And so he probably didn't know which way to run and it just started running and it looked like it was chasing somebody, but it was probably just running as far away as it possibly could. <laughs> I chased my mom um, down up to the corn there. Oh, yeah. no. That must have been pretty scary. Deer can get easily confused. <laughs> um, Timus or Timus? Timusha, you Timusha. can unmute yourself. Um, can I say, um, once I saw uh, five bears in the Sierra Nevada. One when I was little, and then the rest, uh, when, um, some last year, some this year do you know if it was do you know what kind of bear it was was it a polar uh, bear no but i i only see them in, at the night i saw one of two cubs um at the day on the road um and the rest i saw at night oh wow. and then once i was going to get water from the fountain and then i see something moving and it's just the shape of a bear, nice clean bear <laughs> so Robin and here to meet in the campsite and comes to see. Robin, that's actually a great thing to maybe ask you about is how are these bears, um, spectacle bears, um, how are they related to, to the bears that we might have here on the West Coast? Well, actually, GJ, they're they're not very related. They might look like they look like black bears that might have got into some chalk and drew all over their faces but they're actually closest related to, well, their cousin is the panda bear. So if you guys know what the panda bear is, black and white, so maybe the little bit of white markings came from that, but that's that's its closest relative. But it actually evolved from this short-faced bear that, that once survived in Florida, thousands and thousands, well, actually more like 8 million years ago, <laughs> a long time ago. Thank you. Um, let's see, who else do we have have we not heard from? I know your name is not Céline, but you're under Céline Peru's account. So I'll let Sebastian control that. Yes, Céline, so you can unmute. Une fois, pendant la nuit, il y avait un coyote dans mon jardin. Wow, coyote. So Robin, there was a coyote. Maybe your French still is good enough. I know that uh, in Canada it comes and goes and your Spanish is now better than your, yeah. Yeah, maybe even better than garden. your English. <laughs> there's a coyote in the garden, that's right. Yeah. A coyote, so do you um, there's coyotes in, in your area there? Yes, we do, yeah. Nice. Yeah, there was a, a couple months ago actually, and uh, maybe it's still happening, but in San Francisco, because the city was so um, uh, quiet, um, you could see coyotes in places that you typically didn't. We were having um, an outing in, uh, in Golden Gate Park and a uh, herd coyote and then sure enough, 10 minutes later, there he comes like strolling right in front of us, just uh, owning the place. Uh, Oliver, I see your hand up. Uh, Oliver, Oliver, I don't find him. Oliver, can you unmute yourself? I wasn't able to unmute myself, but um, so the spectacled bear is named after the two sort of lighter colored circles around its eyes, right? But yeah. I, but I noticed also that some of the bears um had it like just like here. Yeah, that was, that's really observant of you. Good job for noticing that. Yeah, they they got their names because they many of them have these rings around their eyes. So it looks like they're wearing glasses. But in fact, probably only maybe 10% of them actually have full complete rings. And so they actually have these white dots. So just like you or I, we can tell which bear is which by it's just it's marking and every marking is very different. So it's like a footprint or I guess it's like a footprint. <laughs> DNA footprint. Yeah, good job for noticing that though. Yeah, great job, Oliver. Um, I see Cadell has her hand up. Okay, Cadell, you can unmute yourself. Do these um, spectacle um, bears live in zoos? Mm. Good question. Yeah, they do, actually. And um, 
there used to be some spectacle bears in San Francisco. I'm not sure if they're still there anymore, but there's there's quite a few living in in zoos. And so that's a way that we can also try to protect them for the future. So there's they breed them or they more babies are being born every year in zoos so that they can keep uh, keep bears there in case we need some in the future to help with the pop the wild populations. Yeah, in fact, um, I don't know if any of you have uh, parents who grew up in Paris, but in right next to the house when I grew up in Paris, where there's a uh, one of the oldest zoos in Europe called the Jardin des Plantes. And they used to have a, a pair of spectacle bears there when I was a kid. I remember going to see them. I had no idea that I would one day be roaming their habitat, trying to keep up with Robin on these uh, on these steep cliffs. So it's uh, it's quite incredible. A lot of us have um, have inspiration from from uh, from zoos, and um, and it's a uh, it's great for education. There are some uh, issues and challenges with zoos, but they serve a great purpose for introducing people to wildlife and uh, and ensuring. Some research goes on to protect animals in the wild. I see Jack with a virtual hand up. Yep. Jack, you can unmute yourself. Um, I find Yosemite a pretty vulnerable spot for bears because um, they like once like they get enough food from cars or they get used to the humans eventually the people have to eventually kill them because they've gotten too used to like humans and it could cause them pretty bad things. That's true. Yeah. And that is what that is one of our biggest challenges as well because spectacle bears, for example, when they don't have enough food, they have to go looking for food elsewhere and they go into farm fields that are full of corn and they start stealing all the corn from the farmers. And the farmers get mad and sometimes they even kill the bears and so that's why we need to make sure these bears have enough food all of the time same same problem in the us and in canada as well with black bears and grizzly bears they go into garbages and they steal people's food and then they're unsafe and then we have to kill them okay so i see lots of hands up and i'm not sure how they're being shown on my screen so i don't know if there's an order but um i'll go to zaid and i love that folks are keeping their hand up throughout the whole time even though there's a virtual hand you guys are full of energy they you can i've got coyotes that i've got a ton of animals that are near my house i've got coyotes and jackrabbits and um families family of turkeys and once i even saw a skunk cool wow all around your house there are also deer <laughs> Sounds like a lot of people have a lot of the kids have lots of wildlife around their houses. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I, I uh, I'm gonna go and ask um, Colette. I see your hand up and being patient. Colette, you can unmute yourself. I wanted to say that when I go to Tahoe, um, sometimes like in the winter, they the garbage cans are the compost. You're not allowed to compost and cans are very like they have a lot of latches on them because the bears come and eat it and then people can run over them in their driveways yeah that's true yeah. and that we do that you know in canada as well do you know what we found where where i used to live that the bears knew exactly what day was garbage day and so if you put your garbage out the day before the bear would know oh it's sunday night the garbage is coming tomorrow and he would go down or she would go down into the neighborhood and tip over everybody's garbage so now everything has to be locked and secured and kept inside until two hours before the garbage truck comes to get the garbage so those are all the small things that we can do though isn't it a great idea to help keep wildlife alive and safe I see, uh, I see Nikita down the line has her hand up as well. Nikita, you can unmute yourself. I wanted to say that one time I had um, my coyote that came in my garden and, and that, and they teared up the, and they teared and they tipped over the trash can. Yeah, animals can do a lot of that, a lot of animal interactions. It's great that you all have had so many and I hope that it continues to inspire you. I see Nico also with his hand up. So Nico, go ahead. 
Nico, you can unmute yourself. Um, uh, I noticed that you said that um, the bears and like uh, everyone else, uh, like they, uh, they need each other and it helps humans. Uh, do the bears have any natural predators and uh, what exactly is the role of the bear in the ecosystem? That's a great set of questions. Robin, go ahead. <laughs> well, the, 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 the bear naturally in the wild is the top predator in this area that we work, but humans are the biggest predator. So they're, they can have the biggest effect on the survival of the bears. However, when bears, uh, female bears have their baby cubs and they're outside of the dens, the cubs come outside of these little dens and the mom has to go and feed and drink water. And while she's gone, the cubs start shrilling like this really high pitched squeal like a and screaming at the top of their lungs. And then that brings, I don't know if you guys have heard of what a, a condor, it's like the biggest bird with that huge wing, wingspan. But well, we have condors in our area. And so they come down and they try to catch the little cubs and then the cubs go running back into the cave. But um, that would be the biggest predator probably for the bears in the wild. And what's their role, Robin? Because I think one thing that's important is to understand also the role of top predators in an ecosystem. And that's why so many conservationists um, focus on, on top predators because often when you can conserve those animals, you have a sense that all the rest of the food chain underneath them is, is well protected. So even though a lot of the conservation efforts might look like it's all about bears or all about lions or all about sharks, when you protect those species, you really protect all the rest of the species and the rest of the natural resources that those top species depend on. But what do the bears do specifically for the environment where you live, Robin? Well, there's two important things that these bears do. So as a top predator, they help keep the balance in the ecosystem. So they keep some of the other animals at check, so at bay. So there's up in the high mountains, there's this animal called the tapir. I'm not sure if you guys know what that is, but it looks like a big fat pig with an elephant nose. Well, that big fat pig <laughs> tapir, it's called a mountain tapir. It, if there were no bears in the ecosystem, it would come out and it would eat all of the plants in the Padamo ecosystem. And that ecosystem is storing the water for all of the people and the entire ecosystem. And so by having bears there, they make sure that the tapir don't come out and eat it all. And so they stay in the forest a lot more. And so that's really important. The other thing that bears do is they eat so much food that then when they walk, they leave scats, little poops everywhere. And those little poops have seeds and they always turn into these important trees. And so they help plant the ecosystem. So they keep adding more plants. So it's like our parents, our families going out and buying flowers and putting them into our garden. Well, the bear does it for us. So it disperses seeds all, all over the area. Great, thank you. Uh, GJ, so we, let's have see. Who else? Five, we have five minutes left. Uh, yeah, so, now, so. Sebastian, how do you do that when you have all those questions? <laughs> I'm gonna leave the you speaker. handling those uh, the sensitive <laughs> issues of, of the questions we don't ask. No, yeah, I know. Um, but, you know, um, uh, I wanna thank uh, everybody for their participation. We can take maybe one or two questions left and then we can wrap up. Uh, you know, it has been a, a great presentation. It reminds me how important, you know, wildlife and earth is and that we have to protect. And I hope that uh, it has, you know, given some hopes in, uh, in our future generations to really act for wildlife. And uh, I want to thank you guys for what you are doing. It's an awesome job and uh, I'm really grateful that uh, we have you uh, today uh, on Earth Day. It, it means a lot for us. Well, so. Thank you. It's meant a lot for us. If we can, if, you, if you're if you okay, maybe we take one last question, then we close out. I see Luca Macar has his hand up. Okay, Luca, you can unmute yourself. Okay, um, so how, um, can, do the bears really, like, can the bears move from one place to another without depopulating or something bad happening to them? It, like, is it, is it really, is it hard or is it, how hard is it um, to like go from a different space to a different space? I, um, Robin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, TJ. 
Go, go ahead, ahead. answer that quickly and then we'll close out. Yeah, yeah. Well, so the bears that in our area, they they have found a way to survive in these big, massive cliffs, like the Yosemite Wall. They're, they live up in there and that's the way they can move around without being seen or being in conflict with humans. But between these little areas, they're like little islands of land. There's like a bridge. And so what's happening is what happens if we were to take a bridge away in San Francisco? You can't get from one side to the other side. And so what's happening is those bridges are being removed all of the time by people. And so what we're trying to do is make sure those bridges are always there so the bears can cross and continue to move around without being impacted by humans. Great. Thank you, Robin. I want to, I, I'm going to close out here so that we can end on time. I see tons of questions and um, it fills me with hope, but all of you have comments or questions and want to relate your own experiences with wildlife and nature. Uh, regardless of what, um, what you do and what you end up doing, I think that that love and passion is, is great. And that's what gives me hope. If you want to keep on learning, um, you can always watch any kind of documentaries, pick up books about it, um, join a local nature club. Uh, as I said at the top of a, of a presentation, our organization, the Wildlife Conservation Network, uh, you can look us up online and uh, I can make sure that the, the website is available through the, the newsletter of EB or some other way. We have an event this Saturday. Uh, I put the, the, the web link for the event in the chat. It's uh, wcnexpo.org. There is a free track this Saturday where you can hear uh, presentations from conservationists like Robin um, and they'll be talking about elephants and cranes and rhinos and lots of different species and uh, we do also a larger event um, in the fall and where we can hear about many many more species so I encourage you all to get involved and uh, and to spread the word I want to thank Robin for uh, for taking time out of her busy day and joining us for it uh, I want to thank Robin and, and her whole team in Peru for dedicating their lives to um, making sure that people and, and bears in Peru can, can coexist and thrive. And um, lastly, I want to thank all of you for taking good care of our planet. And I wish you a, a, a wonderful rest of Earth Day, a great, great rest of your school day, because I know you've got a little bit more to do. Yes. And then, um, and thank you for tuning in and thank you, EB, for, for instilling all these values in our children. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to unmute everybody so everybody can maybe, uh, you know, upload or say goodbye. So thank you very much, DJ. Thank you very much, Robin. And uh, it's just the start. So let's keep on the, the momentum. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much. Everybody Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.